let us begin uh, formally begin our uh, colloquium series in which we've had some very distinguished speakers, speakers in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the present one, uh, Mr. Porinjay Guho Thakurta is very, very well known to us. And I'm sure he is also well known to people who will be approaching this email subsequent to my introduction, as well as those who will access the recorded version. He is uh, not only one of India's leading journalists, but he is also a kind of a conscience keeper uh, among journalists. So whether it is the academic profession or whether it is uh, the profession of journalism, I think uh, conscience keepers are very, very important. And therefore, in a multitude of ways, he has tried to expose crony capitalism, democratic deficits, and most recently, he has started his own series of books, which are very, very frank and forthright. He was, uh, until a few years ago, editor of probably South Asia's most widely read academic journal, the Economic and Political Weekly, from which he had to resign because of certain problems uh, that arose because of his frank and forthright nature. So I think uh, in, the, among, in the society where democracy is respected, where rights are respected, where uh, uh, such struggles are fought, he is uh, held in very high regard. And therefore, sometimes <coughs> in the current times, his situation also becomes very difficult. So you can see that, uh, that Mr. Guho Thakurda is now going to tell us the story of Pegasus. Uh, any one of you who have followed the news have a good idea of how a spyware was sought to be used to compromise the personal and private sphere of activists and intellectuals. Uh, Mr. Guho Thakurda happens to be one who was attacked, and he also happens to be one of the most serious investigative journalists. Apart from being a filmmaker and a mentor for many young persons who are in journalism and in academia. So therefore, we think that it's really a privilege for us that he has agreed to speak on this spyware. Uh, the floor is open now for, uh, for your lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Rahul Mukherjee. Thank you, uh, all of you who are present here today, including Shorodipto, better known as Rishi. We work together. Uh, thank you, Syed Hussain. Uh, thank you, Matthias, Felix, Krishna, Farhan, Mia. <clears throat> that was a rather uh, flattering and a fulsome introduction given by Professor Rahul Mukherjee. But I thought before I talk about my own personal experiences and also talk about uh, the impact uh, that the use or rather the misuse of this software has had on India, I would first preface my comments by talking a little bit about what is happening across the world and what is happening in several countries across the world and why this particular spyware developed by an Israeli private company called the NSO Group is the most dangerous software, spyware, cyberware known to humankind. And let me tell you, in July to 2021, more than a year ago, almost a year and a half ago, there was a group of media organized, uh, several media organizations and two uh, international non-government organizations came together in what was described and what has been described as the Pegasus Project. 
essentially what was the Pegasus project? I'll summarize that and then talk about a little bit about what's happening in different parts of the world. About a year or more than a year that means uh, before July 2021, before the findings of this uh, investigation were disclosed to the public at large, what had happened approximately a year ago, that there was a leak, leak of 50,000, roughly 50,000 numbers. These were telephone numbers. And of course you could recognize which countries these telecom these telephone numbers belong to, but you didn't know to whom they belonged. So clearly, this was a leak of information. And I was asked this question by uh, a member of a committee or uh, that was appointed by the Supreme Court of India. Uh, then who do you think leaked this information? Who do you think was the whistleblower? And uh, I replied that I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised that if it, if it was from within the group itself. That means somebody within the NSO group in Israel, probably her or his conscience was pricked and therefore chose to leak this entire database of telephone numbers to a Paris-based international organization called Forbidden Stories. This international non-government organization, which essentially tries to support journalists who are working under difficult conditions uh, in different parts of the world, Forbidden Stories tied up with Amnesty International. And Amnesty International, in turn, engaged the services of a Toronto-based forensic laboratory called Citizen Lab. It's part of the University of Toronto. And even as this partnership was tied up, they realized that in order to find out who these numbers belong to, and there were, of course, these applications and software, including uh, True Caller, which enables you to find out. But not everybody can find out exactly if you just give a person a number, who does it belong to or in whose name was it registered. So this consortium of organizations decided to partner with 17 media organizations, over 80 journalists, and they were located in 10 countries across the world. And in turn, these countries, they tied up with some other countries. So the, the list is quite long and in no particular order, let me just read out some of them to you. Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Kazakhstan, Hungary, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Mexico, Poland, South Africa, Morocco, Israel, France, Pakistan, and of course, India. Not surprisingly, given the fact that India is today the world's most populous country with at least 1.4 billion people, that many of these, or I should say the one country where most of these numbers belong to were from India. Now, among the various media organizations that tied up with Forbidden Stories, Amnesty International, Citizen Lab, these were organizations, well-known organizations, like the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Washington Post of the United States, the, the Guardian of the United Kingdom, 
Le Monde of France, Dizit of Germany, my pronunciation may be a little wrong, Haaretz of Israel. And in India, their partner was The Wire. Now, in order to understand what the software is all about, I will have to give you a little bit of background. One version of this software was developed in 2016, and this was called essentially clickbait software. That means inside your mobile phone, you get a, a message. It could be a short message. Or in, in case you're using an application like WhatsApp, or, or any other application, you get a message or a link to a URL, a universal resource locator, which you don't recognize. Now, you may think it's somebody who's trying to contact you and, and journalists in particular and politicians also. They are used to getting messages from all kinds of people, including people they don't, don't know, haven't met. But as soon as you click on that, link, what happens is that your instrument, it could be a mobile phone, a cellular phone, it could be a, a laptop, it gets infected with what is called malware, also sometimes called a Trojan, like the Trojan horse, you know, in any case, Pegasus was also uh, uh, the name of the winged horse in Greek mythology. So, so a lot of words and phrases from mythology are being used in our discussion. As we shall see over the years, the software evolved and became even more advanced and became what you might call zero click software. Now, what does this mean is that the software can infiltrate into your telephone, into your cellular phone, into your mobile instrument or your laptop without you being even aware that some, some, somebody has or, or some software or somebody is gone into, has compromised or infiltrated your personal gadget. Now, now this is something which makes it truly very, very dangerous. And this is a theme that keeps coming up over and over again. And this is not just a threat to individual privacy. Of course, it is a threat to individual privacy. Many countries have laws about it. Some countries don't have laws about it. In India, we are right now in a situation we are debating a revised data privacy, personal data privacy bill, which is still not law, it's being debated. But not just the privacy of the individual or, the, or, or a particular organization. What this does, as we shall see, as I keep talking, is that it compromises democracy itself. And one of the fundamental tenets and one of the fundamental rights of societies that call themselves democracies, and that is the right to free expression. And we've seen over the years how the giant digital monopolies of the world use these very, very same arguments, the right to privacy, the right to free speech, the right to free expression, the right to remain anonymous, the right to say something, uh, the right to offend somebody else. All these rights, which have various degrees of protection in different parts of the world, these very concepts and freedoms and rights are often used by the very same digital monopolies to justify whatever they do. And I'll, I'll just name a few of them, and I'm sure all of you know about them. There is Meta, which was earlier called Facebook. And within Meta, there is Facebook, there is WhatsApp, and there's Instagram. And there is the 
another set of, uh, there is another conglomerate, uh, which is called Alphabet. And under Alphabet comes various uh, services provided by Google from your, your, your search uh, to publishing, to location, to uh, geographical location services, and a host of other services. Alphabet Incorporated also includes YouTube. And what is not so well known, it is also the owner of the most widely used operating system, which is used inside cellular phones or mobile phones, and that is the Android operating system. And that the majority of telephones across the world are using it. So today in this day and age where we see where the population of the plant planet has reportedly crossed 8 billion. And we have reason to believe that roughly two thirds of the planet is using the internet. Not all very frequently, but certainly using and very, a very small proportion, one third or less, which includes infants, are not using the internet. So this is the world that we are living in today. On this whole issue of the uh, giant multinational conglomerates and the digital monopolies <laughs> that <clears throat> in more ways than one, not only determine what you read, or I, I won't say determine, but certainly influence, often control what you read, what you watch, what you hear, and more than that influences your behavior, predicts your behavior, as Professor Soshana Zubov in her uh, masterpiece, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, you know, the fight for a human future, the new frontier of, frontier of power. This is the title of Soshana Zubov's book, which came out a few years ago. They point out that it's not only predicting your preferences, what you like, what you don't like, the food you like, the films you like, the music you like, the actors you like, the sports persons you like, but your political preferences, political preferences, your ideological preferences, and not that's not all. They're trying to predict your behavior at the end of the day so that you're targeted. You think you're getting a service free, but you are really the product or the service. What is particularly interesting is in the United States Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit, which is in, the, in, in, in California, what we are finding is that the net NSO group technologies and a few similar organizations, that is the makers of Pegasus, have been challenged by the who's who of the information technology. I mean, it's a separate matter that all of them are, are going, many of them are going through a difficult time today and, and they, are, um, they are all, uh, what should I say, uh, laying off thousands and thousands of their employees, be that as it may. This is a document which is worth reading, anybody who's interested, because it's not just the document, but the annexures. And it's very, very interesting, all the people who are part of this petition. It includes Google, of course. It includes Microsoft. It includes um, LinkedIn, Cisco System, GitHub, and uh, the Internet Association, and also VMware. So all these conglomerates have come together and how do they summarize their argument? And it's very interesting how they summarize the argument. They go, go back to an incident in June 2017 where the second largest bank in Ukraine fell victim to a ransomware attack that crippled 90% of the bank's computers. And it spread quickly throughout the country and even the nuclear power plant at Chernobyl that monitor and computers that monitor the radiation levels came down. 
workers had to conduct that monitoring manually. Automatic teller machines stopped working. The post offices were shut down, hospitals, power utilities, airports. And according to then, the then Ukrainian minister for infrastructure, the government was dead. This is his words. It didn't stop at the Ukrainian border. Denmark-based M-A-E-R-S-K, one of the, the largest shipping company in the world, it lost use of its computers, servers, routers, even desk phones for days. So it was not just businesses, including pharmaceutical companies, Merck, the pharmaceutical giant, a Cadbury chocolate factory in Australia, that were all compromised. Suddenly people realized that this kind of spyware could have very, very, very dangerous implications for the network world that we today live in. I'll strongly suggest that all of you who are interested in this subject, please go through this document. It's available in the public domain. It's a 39-page petition, but it lays out exactly what the issues are. So let's first come to the definition. And they say, NSO, the NSO Group Technologies Limited of Israel and other companies like that are investing very, very heavily in creating cyber surveillance tools and selling cyber surveillance as a service to governments, to law enforcing agencies. It's interesting that the NS NSO says, we only sell to government agencies and we only sell after we get due permission from the government of Israel and different departments and divisions of the government of Israel, including it's, it's uh, the export agencies, the, the military authorities, you name it. They're all involved in this. So how do they define this? And I will say that these tools, notably Pegasus, allow the user of this spyware or the software to track somebody else's whereabouts. That means not just where you are located, through the GPS or the geographical positioning service tools, but you can listen into your conversations. You can, they can read your texts. They can look at your emails. They can look at your photographs. They can actually steal all the names on your contact list. It can not only look at them, it has actually download that entire thing. So if I say I have 5,000 names and addresses of individuals who I'm in touch with, and they're from different parts of the country and the world, they can get my entire address phone, phone numbers, addresses. And they can review my search history. They can see which other sites I've gone. Where have I gone? What have I searched for? Have I gone to Heidelberg University? Have I gone to this site? Have I gone to that site? Have I gone to this newspaper or that newspaper? Have I gone to this pornographic website? They can find everything out. So the governments, by using these surveillance tools, which is brought, what? I mean, they pay a price. Yes, they have to go through those permissions. But after they have got it, they can use those, that spyware, to spy on human rights activists, journalists, the political opponents of those who are in power in any particular country, the ruling dispensation or the regimes. It can 
therefore spy on just about everybody. And because this petition is in the US, they're very concerned that they can also spy on US citizens. And therefore it violates a whole lot of laws that have been enacted in the US, including what is called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The Israeli group NSO has sought immunity from these laws through an expansion of the common law of foreign sovereign immunity cover private companies, their actions on behalf of government customers. Now, the point is, huge amounts of money are being spent every year across the world on so-called cyber security. Now, I have one number which is way back, it's quite some time ago. This was uh, uh, sometime, I think, three years ago, or more than three years ago, I would say. Um, this was, yes, um, I'll tell you exactly the date that it'll come to me. It's at the end of that legal document. But over the last four or five years, it can, I mean, they've already got a, yes, 2020. So it's not that long, December 2020. It's two years ago. They are saying that more than $120 billion is being spent on cybersecurity. And therefore, you can see the huge amounts of money that are involved in this. And the argument that is being used is something we must first listen to before we can go into the counter arguments. What does NSO say? Why is their software, according to them, very important? They are saying it helps check crimes of different types. They say whether it be terrorism, whether it be espionage, whether it be drug trafficking, whether it be, uh, you know, child sex offenders, you name it, pedophilics, you name anybody and everybody and they say this software helps us. How? They said it has so advanced that it can even check whether drones or unmanned aerial vehicles are entering into the space, the national sovereign space of a particular country. So if a, a drone comes into the, your air in your territory, yes, this software can detect it. So it's not just trailing somebody who's suspected to be a terrorist or trailing somebody who, who is, you know, uh, suspected to be a, a, a purveyor of child pornography or somebody like that. They say, suppose a building has collapsed. And under the rubble of that building, some people are suspected to be trapped. They may be dead or they may be alive. They don't know. Their phones may be dead. They said Pegasus enables you to even go and find out even if their phones have been damaged. Now, this is a very, very interesting point. So they are seeing that even if your phone is off, we can put it on again. And there is an old case pertaining to what happened in 2019, where WhatsApp uh, were identified. Uh, no, uh, WhatsApp and Facebook, uh, they identified NSO and they sued NSO. And then various others joined in. And, and they're saying these are in violation of various laws. Now, <laughs> essentially, these tools are so powerful and dangerous because they can pick on vulnerabilities in the code that allow one person 
to access another person's device, network, or system. Now, we have seen some absolutely egregious examples of this kind of misuse of software. And let me give you a few examples so that you will know how dangerous it is. In and and and, and the, there are uh, uh, I mean I mean um, there are, there, there is uh, circumstantial evidence to show that just about everywhere these guys have the NSO chaps have been there. Now I'll give you the examples, but before the example I give you, just to elaborate on this point, which are often called vulnerabilities which are unprecedented. They've never been made to feel so vulnerable. And, and I'll just, uh, hacking has happened, leakage of information has happened, and phishing, you know, frauds, trying to steal other people's money. These have been around. I mean, this software have, has been, you buy the software, then you, what is called reverse engineering it, and, and then that software is used by what are called mal malicious actors. So what is happening is that you are giving more and more opportunities for those who are in positions of power to get into the personal lives and look into the lives of every single person. Because even limited use of this software can cause, has, has the potential to cause massive di disruption. And by the time the exploited vulnerability is identified and you stop, a lot of damage has already been done because there's been a cascading downstream effect. Hundreds and thousands of individuals, firms, organizations would all have been affected. And we'll see that it's actually happened here also. Until June, uh, sorry, July of 2021, Apple had claimed that their FaceTime system of voice connection and messaging was the most secure in the world. After July 2021, Suddenly they said, no, it's actually not true. They started a new patch and that patch had to be installed to protect yourself from the vulnerabilities. Now let's look a little bit at what has been some very, very unusual ex examples of what has happened. One of them concerns Khashoggi, Jamal Khashoggi, and you are aware of the terrible circumstances under which he died. His fiance is still fighting for him, but operatives of the Saudi government, they, they tracked his fiance and him, including the time he went into the embassy of Saudi Arabia in Ankara, Turkey. He never came out alive again. And it has been alleged that his body was hacked to pieces. Even today, when the crown prince of Saudi Arabia visits the United States, the Biden administration has granted immunity, immune, immunity from protection, from prosecution, I beg your pardon. This is one example. There are several examples. Princess Khalifa, who re rebelled against her family, she was followed her friend who accompanied her 
on a vehicle on the seas was followed. And yes, with the help of the Indian authorities, she was arrested and taken back. A report of uh, the New York Times, uh, which they spent a lot of time, it appeared on the first of, uh, sorry, the 28th of January this year, 2022. They pointed out how even the United States, the FBI of the United States has purchased the software. But the FBI said, we bought a version of the software for testing and experimentation. And then we gave it back. We decided it would be too dangerous and we won't be using it. And subsequently, of course, the company was also blacklisted. And they realized that this whole zero click spyware is very, very different from the common, common, you know, the hacking software that it had, that had been used. And so there's no evidence left because they can enter into a phone. There is no evidence. And therefore you have computers connecting to a network of servers across the world, hacking the phone, then connecting back to the equipment. And minutes later, every piece of data on that phone has been downloaded, unspooled onto computers. And then there's no more trace. There is no more trace after that. Everything has been read, every email, every photograph, every text thread, everything has been, every personal contact has been read. And then finally, goes away. It's as if nothing had happened. In fact, uh, they call it a gold mine for the intelligence authorities. But and this is really the issue. What is that? NSO and the Israeli government could not put in place safeguards to ensure that the authority to which it was, uh, it had sold its software did not misuse it. Or that some external actor, non-government external actor, could acquire that software and misuse it. Let me talk a little bit about India, because this is a subject I'm a little familiar with. And the sad part of the story, as far as India is concerned, is that There are several governments across the world that are conducting investigations into the misuse of Pegasus because they believe even the heads of state, the heads of government, former prime minister, associates of, of presidents, the, the top political leadership, they were their phones were compromised. Their phones were infiltrated into. Let's name some of these countries. France, Mexico, Hungary, Morocco, South Africa, and interest, uh, interestingly, interestingly, Israel itself. And this is important. Let me give you what I think is a political angle, but a very important political angle. The former head of the Israel government, Bennett, he was very keen 
that the Israeli police find out who among his own supporters had been infected by Pegasus. During the time, Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, was in power. And many people believe that there is this strong political angle. Now that Netanyahu is back in power in Israel, we do not know whether these investigations will conclude or not. But as far as the Indian government is concerned, and this is the really sad part of the story as far as I'm concerned, and I speak from my personal experience, the government of India is neither confirming nor denying that it bought this software. It is neither saying yes, neither saying no. Before I tell you the sequence of events of what happened in India, let me share some of my own personal experiences so that you can understand what happened. Now, in 2021, the peak of the second wave of COVID, I received a phone call from a journalist who I didn't know that well. I knew her a little bit. Her name is Sandhya Ravi Shankar. I'm based in the northern part of India. I'm, I'm based in the national capital. And she's based in southern India. The other, uh, she's uh, um, located a good, I should say, at least about, what about? maybe 2,500 or 3,000 kilometers south of where I am. And I knew her because we were, we have been part of a, a, an association, the Foundation for Media Professionals. So I met her only on one occasion and had a couple, we exchanged pleasantries. I can't say I know her very well. So she suddenly called me up and says, I have to meet you tomorrow. I said, why, what's happened? Why the urgency? She said, no, I must meet you tomorrow. I said, look, there's a problem. I have to travel out. He said, no, no, please get some time out. I'm flying in from Chennai, where she's based. I'm coming into Delhi late at night. Tell me where I have to meet you. So she was so persuasive. I said, you have to come to my home at 6 a.m. in the morning. She, I said, how much time do you want? I said, I want at least two hours. So I said, you have to come at six. Then hopefully everything will be done by eight and then I can go about doing my work. And they also, I mean, she also told me that please ensure you have a good Wi-Fi working. I said, sure. I was very, very puzzled and mystified. And why is this woman who I hardly know insisting on meeting me? And when I said six o'clock, she said yes. In fact, she arrived at six o'clock when I wasn't really sure she'd come at six o'clock. I was still sort of rubbing the sleep of my eyes when she came there. And then she told me, we want to examine your phone. And she gave me this whole story, forbidden stories. I'm representing forbidden stories. We've got the list of journalists' phone numbers and your name is among them. So please allow me to examine your phone. So I said, what if I don't? He said, then I'll go back. So I said, okay, examine my phone. So she put everything on my mobile phone that everything has to be done. Sorry, what's that? That's my phone. I'm sorry about that. Please excuse me. Uh, so what I was saying is that I put my phone on a silent mode, but uh, airplane mode, but it's still ringing. So anyway, what happened is every, every bit of data was taken out. 
and it was put on a cloud and amnesty gave it to citizen lab. The whole process was repeated once, it was repeated twice, three times. And a few months later, they got back to me and said, your phone was compromised in the months of March, April, and May 2018. So I said, who? Who's done it? And she said, and we were on a meeting with another representative from Paris, who in touch was in touch with the technical people and said that, sorry, we can't. We don't know who has invented your phone. All we know is that your phone was, our forensic analysis shows that your phone has been compromised. Then they started asking me, what were you doing at that time? What were the articles you were working on? So then I explained to them, and any of you are interested, you can read those articles. Uh, one was about the foreign assets of a person who used to be the richest man in India, the late Dhirubhai Ambani, and it was a detailed investigation. Then I also wrote a book about Facebook's activities in India. I was working on that. So that was around the time my phone was allegedly compromised. Why am I giving you my personal account? And that's important for you to understand that the idea was not to only to get after me or to find out what I'm talking to my wife, what I'm talking to my children, what I'm talking to my sister, or what? No. The idea is to send a message, a chilling effect. There should be a chilling effect so that the person who leaked this information, we journalists who work on investigations, we have to depend on information from whistleblowers. We have to depend on information which is sensitive. We have to depend on information and then verify. So in my case, after I got this information, I wrote to the, the sons of the late Sri Dhirubhai Ambani to ask them, is this information correct? Because it's very, very detailed information, granular information, details of bank accounts, flow charts to show how the money moved from here and there, Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, here, there, everywhere. Read it. It's called carving up a business employer through tax havens, the Ambani way. Carving up a business empire through tax havens, the Ambani way. It was published by the portal called Newsclick in the month of May 2018. It's information in the public domain. You'll see what it was about. So this is one of the primary purposes of misusing this software that you not only tell the people who are your political opponents, who are opposed to you, that you're being listened into, it sends a message across. The chilling effect is for others. If you leak information, you think your conscience is clear and you want to leak out the information because you think it is very important, but We'll get you. I mean, let's look at some of the people whose names came up in the investigation. The head, the then head of the Indian National Congress, the largest opposition party, Rahul Gandhi, all his aides, even people with whom he had social contact, with whom he had no, I mean, he's a politician right now. He's embarked on a long walk across India from the, the south to the north of India. But these were his personal associates. I mean, personal friends, you can say. Social acquaintances. Even their names came up. And the portal, the wire that disclosed all these things, they redacted the names. But they said, yes, they are there. There was the name of the nephew of the chief minister of West Bengal, Abhishek Banerjee. There was a political strategy called Prashant, a strategist called Prashant Kishore. A government officer 
who holds a was holding an important position in one of India's leading external intelligence agencies by the, uh, that's called the R and A W Research and Analysis Wing, which is part of the Cabinet Secretariat. Jitendra Oja had challenged the, his compulsory retirement. He was looked into. The interesting part of it, there were even people within the government who were being spied on, including, ironically, the person who went on to become the Union Minister for Information Technology, Communications and the Railways, Mr. Ashwini Vaishnav. You found personal assistance to chief ministers and former chief ministers, judges of the Supreme Court of India, lawyers of those who had been accused of working against the government, and those who are absconders, people who have fled India. The diamond merchant Nidav Modi, his lawyers were spied on. Uh, the Britisher, Christian Michael, who has been, who is in jail in account of a helicopter scandal, his lawyer was spied on. And most importantly, there are a whole lot of very, very important human rights activists in India, some of whom are still behind bars, some of whom have been very recently released on bail, it was found that their computers had been not just hacked into, false information had been planted to implicate them. These includes uh, the, those who we called the Bhima Koregao case, where they were uh, accused of uh, sedition and trying to create enmity among classes. People like Professor Hani Babu, Rona Wilson, Vernon Gonzalez, Anand Taltumde, who has just got bail, Shoma Sen, Gautam Navlaka, who has just been released on uh, by house arrest, lawyer Sudha Bhardwaj, Bhardwaj, who's out on bail, Arun Ferreira, a whole lot of others. You had a case of an election commissioner, India's election commission, there is a uh, a person who's a, um, who was the election commissioner, he dissented against two of his colleagues. He is now in the Asian Development Bank in Manila. His name is Ashok Lavasa. He was, his phone was Pegasus. The former head of India's premier investigating agency, Alok Varma, the ex Central, uh, the ex-director of the Central Bureau of Investigation is born. So what happened after this? And, and those who are not from India may find this a little boring, but I'll try and give you the big picture. What happened was that in October 2021, after several months of deliberation, the Supreme Court of India finally decided that they were indeed going to appoint a committee. It was a six-member committee headed by a former judge of the Supreme Court. And uh, his name is Justice Ravindran. And he was being uh, supported by two officials, one of whom was the former head of the RNAW. And with him, there would be various other technical people, professors of forensic sciences, and they put out public advertisements and they said, anybody and everybody who wants to have their phone examined may do so. I was among them I'm because I was among the petitioners. Several journalists chose not to, but I was among them. And my phone was examined. They gave me a hashtag. It, this is just a matter of a few hours. It took six hours for me. They said, we'll give you your hashtag in a few hours. It took them three days to give it. And this, is, this was done at the 
Indian Institute of Technology, which is India's premier educational institution, uh, science and technology educational institution. Wait, the story doesn't end here. There were a few of us, including some people who were social activists, his wife, and then a report was prepared. After many delays, after several extensions of that tenure, or to the former Chief Justice of India, Justice Ramana. And Justice Ramana was the person who had instituted this committee. The day before he demitted office, after concluding his term, he took out a voluminous report from behind a sealed cover. And with him were two other judges on the bench. And made a categorical statement. The government did not cooperate. While the proposal was being worked out as to whether you should have a committee or not, the Solicitor General of India, representing the government of India, neither confirmed nor denied. He says, I won't say yes or no. So, Justice Ramana, in his oral observations in an open court, said the government refused to cooperate. Now there is speculation, there is circumstantial evidence. A former member of parliament belonging to the ruling BJP, the Bharti Janta Party, he has uh, alleged that there has been a sudden spike in the budget of uh, that is being used, uh, that is uh, the National Security Advisor's Office, the National Security Council Office. Investigative journalists working uh, uh, in the OCCRP, the Organized Crime uh, and Corruption Reporting Project, have recently come out with a report saying that this particular uh, India's imports show that the India imported some software, which is very similar in specifications. The New York Times has made certain allegations which have still not been denied by any government body. And it says that in July of 2017, when India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi became the first Indian Prime Minister to visit Israel, and at that time Netanyahu was the the head of U, uh, uh, the, the head of uh, government in Tel Aviv, and they signed an agreement. They signed an agreement worth two billion US dollars, roughly two billion. Sorry, it is June of yeah, it's July 2017. And by the way, one of the people whose phones uh, is, is, is suspected to have been infected with some colleagues of the former Prime Minister of Pakistan. Imran Khan, and also the former head of government of France, Macron. So according to the New York Times, $2 billion worth of sophisticated weapons and armaments and intelligence gear, including Pegasus, was purchased. So where do we stop? I, I'm going to stop now with one final comment. Uh, so not a comment, an observation, saying that after Justice Ramana said that we can release the observations and the findings of the committee, put it up in the public domain. This hasn't been done. The outgoing Chief Justice, Justice Ramana, more than three months ago said within a month, that is by the end of um, September, this case would be taken up. It still hasn't been taken. I'm not very optimistic that we will get to know more about it. But the very fact that the government is in a state of denial and refusing, refusing to say even yes or no tells a lot. 
the government of the Eastern Indian state of West Bengal had also instituted a committee headed by a former judge of the Supreme Court of India, Madan Lokur, and a former acting chief justice of the High Court uh, of uh, Kolkata, Jyotirmoy Bhattacharya. That committee is in limbo because the Supreme Court stayed the working of the committee. And interestingly, it was based on a petition moved by a non-government organization based in Haryana, uh, the state where I am living in, uh, that has very close connections with the government and the ruling right-wing Hindu nationalist political party, uh, Bharti Janata Party, and it's a social organization which supports it, which is called the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Seva Sangh. So I essentially will stop. I, I don't want to continue, but take any questions. And uh, I, I see that we are at a particular point of time, a very, very important point of time in the history of humankind. At one stage, it was thought that the NSO group would go bankrupt. It would have to be sold to some other company. But several clones have been made of the Pegasus software. I seriously don't see that happening. I wouldn't be surprised if the NSO group, this company survives under the new regime of uh, Netanyahu. And uh, let's hope uh, that this issue becomes a matter of public importance. Because for many people in different parts of the world, it is not. They say, how is it important to us? And uh, therefore, uh, I think it is important to raise awareness. There is a question raised here on the chat box by Felix, uh, because he doesn't have a microphone. Uh, he says that, I don't want to blame the victims, but since 2013, at least it must have been clear to every politically exposed person to not rely on proprietary closed software, which is running on 99% of mobile phones. Why do you think there's so many activists, publicly exposed people who are still using those devices, comfort public campaigns for the safety of the problematic software? What can we do to educate more vulnerable people on the alternatives that do exist? It's an excellent question, Felix. Uh, the problem is, it's convenience. There is an issue of convenience. People, I've been using my mobile phone for the last five years. People say, why haven't you got a new phone? I said, why don't you give me a new phone? You're so concerned about me. But the point is, even if I change my phone, I'll still have the same as I am or the subscriber identity module. And my friends, I have friends in the intelligence agency who tell me in confidence that they can do what they like. There are certain laws. We have a century plus old Indian Telegraph Act. We have all kinds of rules, but there are rogue elements, not only within the government, but people who've uh, misused this and sold it outside. So yes, I, you can tell me, I should only communicate on proton mail. And then I have to ensure that everybody else I communicate with also has proton mail. I will, you will say that I should only use Signal. Many people I know are technologically challenged. I consider myself to be technologically challenged. They're not using Signal. I thought FaceTime was very secure. But no, Apple then tells me after Pegasus that no, you must download this patch. So at one level, we say we must be personally, that there should be personal hygiene, physically and otherwise. But it's easier said than done. Many activists, many political people, the sheer convenience, the, the, uh, the fact that that mobile phone, this mobile phone has become part of our lives. Even today in India, we are debating what are the rules that should be followed, whether a law enforcing agency can seize your personal electronic devices. And there is no convention that is yet to uh, find a convention consensus on it. More importantly, there are enough people who misuse the law. And by the time the courts or others intervene and say, no, you should not have done this and haul up the offending law enforcing the officers who are supposed to enforce the law. 
the damage has been done. In the case of the Bhira Bhima Koringa activists, their phones were infected. So the process in India is the punishment. Therefore, Felix, you are fine in saying we need to make people aware that they, they should use secure systems. They should use have that personal hygiene. It's not an easy task. Social activists, politicians, journalists are not used to, uh, you know, maintaining such hygiene after after Pegasus. I have. So if you come to my home, I'll put on the loud music. I'll put my phone and tell you to keep my phone outside or next to that the music, so that if somebody's spying in, they'll listen to the music. But look. Every system is not foolproof. All these codes, there were vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities in those codes that were exploited by the hackers. India has, is, is number one in the world. I mean, the number of hackers we have in this country, uh, there was a recent report by Reuters. There was another report by Sunday Times, which shows they, they, how they're hacking in. They're hacking into the accounts of lawyers specific lawyers, law enforcing agencies. And here is the government who's doing it to its own, own also. I know a particular individual who is holding a very important position in an intelligence agency. I've known him for several years. He likes me at a personal level. But he said, look, I can't talk to you. Every bit of my own move is being followed. So I can't even say, leave your phone at home. I'll leave my phone at home. And we go, go for a long walk in the middle of a park and there's nobody around. Do we know if there's a drone above us? No. Look, at the end of the day, we are living in a surveillance raj. We are living in a surveillance state. There has to be greater awareness among ordinary people. It's not people like us. We are the elite. The notion of privacy, the notion, I mean, the, what surveillance does to individual freedom, to freedom of expression, to the very bedrock, the very foundation of democratic societies, a lot of awareness has to be generated among people. So I've tried to answer your question, Felix. Uh, if there's any other question from anybody else, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, uh, Felix has written something else. Uh, uh, yeah. Signal, this is Felix for you. Signal doesn't even help if the device is in infected. The new iOS has a special lockdown mode for security. Otherwise, get help by a security specialist. Ideally, use an old laptop, which is bought by cash with Linux on a bootable USB stick that needs to be encrypted and kept separately. It is very difficult to think about these things for normal users. If anyone here needs help, I have a three and a half year old background in cybersecurity company, free consulting. I would think that zero day attacks will come forever and can't be stopped. So we must defend ourselves with alternative old tech if possible. Uh, it's possible uh, with alternative old tech it's possible modern tech comes in with the regime of surveillance capitalism, as you said. Thanks a lot. Very, very good observations you made, Felix. You surely know this subject better than many of us here. Uh, but you're also asking us to sacrifice our convenience. You're also asking us to sacrifice the speed at which we do our work. You're also asking us to sacrifice several things which make our life more def difficult. Yeah, if that's the price you have to pay, well, that's the price you have to pay. Convincing others that that's the price they must pay, it's easier said than done. You're so right, and it's sad. No, 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 don't be sad, Felix. We have to fight. We have to fight. We have to struggle. We have to raise awareness. Krishna Bora, you want to say something? I Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, to me, you are audible. Okay, so I had a question about the data bill that's being discussed in India now. Let us, uh, let us just excuse me, uh, Krishna. I think let us take two questions together. 
Because Fawad also had a question. Yeah. So, so my question is quite brief. Uh, one of the many things that this bill purportedly does is to ease uh, data transfers among uh, across borders. And this will be a select number of countries that the government decides. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on this and also how delaying the bill may have already had very serious implications on data privacy in India. Uh, uh, you want, uh, me, uh, uh, I mean, there was somebody else who had another question to ask. Uh, I'll be happy yeah. to take both together. Yeah, I, was, I, was yeah, I have a question. I have a very childish question. Uh, I want to know where do we go from here if, you know, as someone uh, who was very active in political circles in Pakistan, I know that, you know, I'm being surveilled. So where do we go from here? I mean, what's the, you, you said that we should struggle for it. We should struggle against it. We should put some resistance, but how do we go about it? I mean, what as, as, a, as a political activist or as a person who, uh, you know, who, who is a student can do about it, about how to fight this system, basically? Okay, I think uh, to answer the second question first, whether you're in Pakistan, whether you're in India, whether in Iran, you have to sacrifice your comfort. You have to forget about your mobile phone. Leave it somewhere far away. If you want to talk to another person and you want to share something which you don't want others to hear, go for a walk in the middle of a park, in the middle of the road where there's a lot of ambient noise. Yeah, you can still be tracked, you can still be traced. There's no other way out. So you sacrifice your comfort, you sacrifice the convenience of the phone, you sacrifice the ease with which you get in touch with A or B or C. There's no, that's, that, that's the sacrifice. That's the extra difficulty you have to go through. If you, if, if you are in a regime where you have to be secure, again, I don't know about Khashoggi. I, I mean, I, I mean, all I know about Khashoggi is what I've read in various publications. Various people have various things to say about him. But look what they did to him. You wouldn't wish that of your worst enemy. And it's only his widow who's shouting. And the man who has not denied his complicity in Khashoggi's death, the Biden administration has allowed him Immun has given him immunity from persecution. Krishna, uh, the data privacy bill is a subject of a detailed discussion. And I'm frankly not, uh, not uh, an expert, but this has been in the making for several years. It's gone through a parliamentary committee. There were large numbers of objections that were raised. Finally, the government said, okay, there were so many objections, let's scrap it. What they put in place is very different, it's not very different from what it was earlier. You have a, a law which is a colonial era law, which is over a hundred years old, and you have don't have enough checks and balances to prevent misuse of that. And the point that you specifically said about cross-border data exchanges, the counter argument is how can you have foreign trade? How can you have business? How can you have exports? How can you have imports? If you, if you put such important curbs, then the question is, do you want to be like China? Develop your own version of your Facebook and Google, your WeChat and, and Baidu and so on and so forth. So the uh, 1.4 billion people out of 8 billion people are not using, going using the data. Jack Ma's company, Alibaba, could have been one of the big guys. But no, he's been cut down to size. So at the end of what you are saying, is a bigger issue and a far more complex issue. And that is where the struggles have to go in that direction. And that is issues of internet governance. Barely three decades old in the internet, right? The founding fathers of the internet, starting from Tim Berners-Lee and others, 
said they are appalled at what the internet has become. Here was what they envisaged as something close to, an, to a utility which would empower people, weaken autocracies. And here it has become tools that are being exploited by a handful of giant conglomerates based in the United States. We're seeing a blowback, bipartisan blowback, even within the United States, even within the Federal Trade Commission, even within the, 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 um, the, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. We are seeing a blowback in Germany, in France, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada. But the bigger issue, when you talk about data privacy, localization of data, storage of data, sovereign control over data, and cross-border flows of data, you come into a series of very complex issues. So if you need, I mean, if you believe that the internet should be treated like a utility, like the air we breathe, breathe in, like the oceans, the water we drink, the land on which food is grown, you know, notions of private property and public utilities and the need for regulation. What kind of regulation? Light, light touch, heavy handed. Who are the stakeholders, governments, scholars and educational institutions, the corporate bigwigs, civil society activists representing users and consumers, and a plethora of multinational plurilateral organizations from a host of United Nations organizations like the United Nations a conference for Trade and Development, to the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, to the World Trade Organization and its TRIPS agreement, the trade-related intellectual property rights. So it gets very complex. The point is, we are stuck somewhere in the middle. It's a bit like we make a little gain as we are on the issues of climate change, there is still no clear consensus as how to have mechanisms with all these stakeholders will be represented. There was a huge debate on ICANN, you know, on assigned names and numbers, which ostensibly is a not-for-profit, non-government organization, but is funded by the U.S. Department of Commerce. We are seeing today that blowback. How important it is, how long it will uh, conclude, are difficult questions to answer. Yeah, today we are in a situation where suddenly big tech is no longer glamorous. Everybody's throwing out employees in thousands of numbers, not just Mr. Elon Musk after acquiring Twitter. We're seeing it everywhere. Read the way the monopolies work. Read, read Lena Khan, who went on to join the US Trade Commission while she was an academic a lawyer, she pointed out, our very notion of monopoly, vertical monopolies, horizontal monopolies, diagonal monopolies, all of these are undergoing major changes. And as Soshana Zuboff and others have pointed out, this is a new era, an era which we are, we, whether we've peaked and from here onwards, it, it won't go up further, Let's see, time will tell. I don't know enough. Uh, what extent is it been used in Pakistan? Pakistan and Israel don't have ideal relations. You're right. I really don't know the answer to this question for Han Zahir. I mean, the story is that Mohammed Bill, MBS, he actually called up Netanyahu. So, in international relations, you know, the relations between these different countries are quite, have, have uh, constantly changed, constantly evolved. That's all I can say, uh, according to the New York Times and other reports that have come out. Apparently, you know, they have become buddies. They became buddies. When it comes to the use and the misuse of this kind of dangerous spyware.
So there are very, very ma major ramifications, major implications from personal privacy, freedom of expression, whistleblowing, the chilling effect it has on whistleblowers to individual governments of nation states, to what is happening across the globe, to multilateral organizations, to international NGOs. So this is really a subject on which we have to continue debating, continue discussing, and continue fighting to use the subtitle of Professor Zuboff's book, The Fight for a Human Future in the New Frontier of Power. I couldn't have expressed it better than her. Tough questions, difficult questions. We in India know we, uh, I mean, social media has changed Indian society like ways we could never have imagined. It's all happened in very little time. There's been a recent uh, study done by the Center for the Study of Developing Society, CSG, as with Lok Niti, which has talked about how uh, their study on the media, which is a respondent-based, uh, survey-based study, what it shows about Indian society. I mean, look, that gadget today is controlling the lives of such large numbers of people. What's up? 500 million users of WhatsApp in India. Please go and see a film in Netflix called The Social Dilemma. And there's a very interesting story it tells you. There are only two categories of businesses within inverted commas that describe their con con that their consumers as users. Consumers are being used, fast moving consumer goods, you consume goods. Here your consumer is called a user. One is the social media, social media, the digital monopolies, the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the WhatsApps of the world. And the other is your neighborhood drug dealer or the bootleg. These are the two categories of businesses that describe their consumers as users. Are you going to be a user? Are you going to be a citizen first? These are very, very basic, very, very fundamental questions that have to engage us. I'm a senior citizen, I'm old, but young people, all you young people who are listening to me, hearing me and those who would hear, these are issues that are very important and going to become increasingly important for the future of humankind. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, basically not only heard about technology, but I am beginning to see sort of another argument in favor of what John Keane called the new despotism. Uh, we can argue whether the new despotism is new or whether it is old. That uh, there's one view that the despots of today, the authoritarians of today are different from the despots of yesteryears. And then there is another argument that suggests that no, uh, the, the sunshine can still come back and the struggle must go on. And however new the forms of despotism might be, uh, there will certainly be light at the end of the tunnel. So I think we are looking at a, at a despotic regime which uh, wants to control its citizens by robbing them of their privacy. And uh, some of us in the department are working quite intensively on the kind of attacks that are taking place on India's civil society. And in that milieu, I'm teaching a class on India's democratic backsliding and I'm offering six lectures in my comparative politics class on democratic backsliding in general and in South Asia as a region. Uh, so if you want to put this lecture in, in that context, then it implies that it's not just that non-governmental organizations are being hit 
through the Foreign Contributions Regulation Act and the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. It is not just that uh, human rights activists are being hit through false allegations made regarding them uh, through the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Mm. It is also that individuals are being targeted in such a way that they can fall victims of some of these measures. And in that respect, uh, the internet is being used as a technological instrument through which you can not only take the privacy away from citizens, but in many ways take away their freedoms. Uh, and it is not just the freedoms of those citizens who are incarcerated that are at that are in question. It is also the freedoms of many more citizens uh, who do not use technology, but whose rights are being supported by activists who use technology. So in many ways, I, I found that uh, this was not just a talk about technology. It was uh, not just a talk about how uh, privacy and personal freedoms are being attacked, but it was also a talk about an instrument that is being used to unleash a new form of despotism. And obviously, once the technology becomes available, it becomes available, and it becomes available for a price. <laughs> it becomes available for a price. Then politics can intervene, but prices can transcend politics and uh, or, you know, clones can transcend politics and you have no way of knowing how uh, these uh, technologies proliferate to reinforce ideas that go against the fundamental notion of rights and the fundamental notion of liberty and the fundamental notion of the idea that uh, social cohesion must not just be built through a surveilling state. So I think we have to think about uh, this technology and the very rich presentation that we have got both from an international perspective, uh, how damaging it is in terms of the nexus that comes together to deal with a large number of uh, organizations and people, but also from the perspective of students of South Asia because India happens to be the one South Asian country that has been hit quite badly and, uh, and, and Parandra has pointed out that that is actually a fact that more Indians were targeted than, uh, than any other citizen. So I think this, at least for me, opens up ways of thinking. I'm sure I can't do this research right now, but uh, as we make progress trying to understand the attacks, I think this must become a very important area of scholarly concern. And I think, Parandra, thank you very much for leading us in that direction. And hopefully, you can support us even intellectually as we try to get more and more depth in this area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rahul Mukherjee, for your kind words. Uh, you know, the people who are here have been very, very observant, very, very, I mean, Felix, Krishna, uh, Farhan, Fawad, um, the jazz, very, very meaningful quotation. Uh, Nehru, India's first prime minister on Gandhi, the father of our nation. And, and I, I keep thinking, you people are sitting somewhere else. You're in Germany, I'm in India. But many of us are also able to think together. I mean, for me, the huge challenge is can we make the issues that we've just discussed, can we reach out to people who are not as privileged as we are? Are these issues for them? People who live in crowded tenements, women who have to bathe in the open. What does privacy mean? What does freedom of expression mean to you? You know, these are questions that uh, 
I think all of us need to engage with because they are very important questions. I mean, thank you so much for... No, that's actually very, very important because in a pre-internet age, uh, with better social organization on the ground, you could you could move the spirit of the times in different ways. But in an age of internet, you can actually in rural areas, in, in bustis and in street corners, make an impact with a body of ideas in a way that is very different. And, and I think what you're pointing to and what some of your work is pointing towards, which you are translating in Hindi and in other languages, uh, making it accessible is extremely important. Uh, and I think the two have to go in tandem, as it were. Because, uh, first of all, we need to spend a lot of time thinking about what is actually happening. And then we have to reach it out to the people who uh, might join our gang in that thought process. And so thank you all very much then. We'll remain connected and... Uh, if you are not coming to Europe soon, then we will catch up when we are in New Delhi or in South Asia next. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank I you. have no immediate plans mm. uh, unless um, something happens which I cannot anticipate. Sure. Thank you all very much for being here. Rishi, I hope you are doing well. Yeah, I am. I am Paranjay. It's good to hear you after a long time like this. Good to see you healthy, looking good with the beard as well. You, you, since you've been with, we worked together for several yeah. months. I suppose yeah. many of these things are also familiar to you. But uh, thank you so much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you again.